Hey, what's up, everybody? Gonna do a uh, classic rock reaction, man. Uh, this is the music of Pink Floyd. Uh, Pink Floyd, um, this is going to be, uh, yes, it's a complimentary quad, but it actually features three songs. Uh, one of them is quite an extended jam, so it's going to be running almost 12 minutes long. So that's pretty much two in one, hence a complimentary quad. Um, and all of these songs are live in concert, so that's really, really cool. Also qualifies for uh, slash Patreon exclusive. But anyways, man, um, I want to give a shout out first and a thanks to Francisco Giolo. Francisco, thank you, man. Thank you uh, for sending me these great uh, uh, songs, These uh, this link to these great songs. I'm sure they're great songs. And um, the songs are Green is the Color, Cymbeline, and finally Embroil. And uh, so Francisco also wrote me a note here. He said, uh, Hello, Wayne about your Pink Floyd experience, here are three live songs from their 70s era. It'll lead you to another dimension, as they were at the climax of their psychedelic era. Trust me. I'm happy to bring these songs to, to you. Uh, we have many things in common, and one of these is Pink Floyd. The album is nice, but the live rendition is something else. Peace. Francisco. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. So, let's kick this off starting with green is the color man it's been a while since i've done a pink floyd i still gotta complete the uh uh pompeii uh stuff i need 48 hours y'all all right man green is the color let's get it Shine in her eyes, but moonshine made her. 
But are they trying to tune us into how you feel when you're tripping? Kind of like when you're buzzing on weed or something? Is that? Oh, that's a sudden drop off there. Okay. It must have been kind of uh, going right into another tune. All right, man. Yeah, not too long. It was only four minutes. Green is the color, and it was live in Belgium in 69. I got to... Uh, I got to get a more better idea of... Uh, the meaning of the song, what they were trying to really say. I'm only getting pieces and bits of the picture. I know there's a interest of a lady involved and whatnot, but uh, yeah, I'm not catching the full. I, I gotta get the lyrics in front of me and read it. Um, good tune though, good, good tune. I'm sure that they could have extended it for a good long while there, jammed for quite a while. It's unlike Pink Floyd, especially in a concert setting, to uh, have such a short uh, tune. And I think that it was basically segueing into something longer, for sure. And now it makes me wonder what the, uh, um, the studio rendition sounds like. Take this off. I'm probably talking too loud. All right. So, man. Um, let's do a little background and see if we can get some info on this song, the meaning behind it, what it represents, what these lads are trying to tell us, or tell me. I feel that I have uh, missing a piece of info here, and uh, maybe a little read can fill in some blanks for me, man. Green is the color. Um, yeah, David Gilmore is one of those guitarists um, that when he plays his guitar, it's as if he's talking to you through it. There's a couple of guitars that have that effect uh, on me, and he is one of them. You know, um, it's such a soulful experience when he plays his guitar. Man. And he's a great singer as well, you know, all around great talent, great musician, great songwriter. Uh, he can really arrest your uh, imagination. I believe the first song. I don't know if it's the first Pink Floyd song I heard, but it was the first Pink Floyd song I really noticed and it arrested my mind um, was uh, Learning to Fly. And I learned later that it was during the David Gilmore years, that's after um, uh, Roger's departure. But all the same, he still had that cerebral effect because it just got my attention. I was just sitting there just taking it all in, you know, and it's like, yeah, this is Pink Floyd, man. I'm like, oh, man, I got to get to know them a little bit better. That was years ago. Anyway, so let's come back to the present, man. Uh, green is the color. So green is the color is a track on Pink Floyd's 1969 more. It was composed and written uh, by Roger Waters and sung by David Gilmore. A tin whistle is heard in the song played by drummer Nick Mason's then-wife, Lindy. A live version of the song was released as the third single to promote the early years from 65 to 72 box set in the October 2016. In October of 2016. Live. Live arrangements of the song were performed as a full electric band piece and at a slower tempo. Okay, so the studio version is faster than what we just heard then. Richard Wright built a calm sheen of warbling organ sound throughout, which created a more natural segue into the piece that allows immediately follow, that always immediately followed it. Careful with that axe, Eugene. Okay. Yeah, hence that sudden drop off there. Okay. David Gilmore also sang a scat vocal over his guitar solo during the outro. In a live intro to the song from 1970, Roger Waters states that the song is about being on Ibiza, the setting of the film more. I gotta check out this film. I never knew of uh, this film. 
In the Man and the Journey Suite, the song was retitled The Beginning, In the Journey, Half of the Show. It was played as a medley with Besset by the Creatures of the Deep, which was a retitling of Careful with That Axe, Eugene. The song was a regular part of the band's shows from early 69 through 1970, then less common in 71. It was played for the last time during their short tour of Japan and Australia in August of 71. The song was later played by Nick Mason's Saucer Full of Secrets. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of uh, post Pink Floyd that I've got to explore as well. Uh, David Gilmore, I believe, going back to Pompeii in 2016. And then Roger Waters, he's got some solo stuff going on. And uh, Nick Mason, Saucer Full of Secrets. I believe it's his own uh, band and, and tour. Lots and lots of Pink Floyd to uh, check out, especially for the patron exclusive, man. All right, so that is the info given for Green is the Color. Uh, decent background information. I still really, really got to dig into um, the full meaning of it. I'm still not catching it in full. Um, fill me in if, if you uh, have a better idea as to what uh, the message of the song is. I'm still kind of missing it. All right, man. Let's check out our second track. And that being Cymbeline. Decent size too, it's over six minutes. Pink Floyd, Cymbeline. Let's get it. Shot up the crowd right away.
It's the same these guys can just jam for days. Second time I've seen uh, Roger at that gong. It's definitely a part of his uh, uh, expressiveness and everything. The last was it the last reaction I did uh, live in Pompeii. He was also on the gong and the silhouette. He's kind of like on top of the hill and he's beating the gong. That was quite quite an awesome looking shot. Wow, you talk about a cerebral tune, man. Fantastic, man. Cymbeline. Very, very good, man. Never heard of this song at all. And I think he's just basically singing about um, having a bad dream, a nightmare. Maybe he's really tripping out in the dream, and uh, he's having visions of uh, Doctor Strange, I guess the sorcerer from Marvel Comics. I think that's who he's referring to. And uh, he feels like he's probably being uh, uh, shown things by Doctor Strange or experiencing things at the hands of Doctor Strange. That's how trippy his dream is. I think that's the message that I'm getting. Um, good tune overall, man. Great musicianship. Yeah, when I look at Pink Floyd, when they're in their session, when they're doing their thing, they are just so in it. You know, they're just so into it. You know, Roger's got his head down and he's really got a relationship going with his bass. And uh, they all do, you know, even Nick watching Nick, you know, I, uh, you talk about a cerebral drummer and you talk about drummers being appropriate for a certain band. Man, can you think of a drummer more appropriate for Pink Floyd than Nick Mason? It certainly couldn't be a Keith Moon, you know what I'm saying? Not even a John Bonham, uh, maybe closer a Neil Peart. But um, yeah, Neil has uh, an element of the cerebral, but then again, uh, I think that at some point in time, he would really need to just kind of let loose. And Pink Floyd's music uh, doesn't really um, render that platform. So, you know, you need the right kind of drummer uh, in order to fit in. Uh, you need the right kind of musician for everything. But it seems to me, um, after uh, a little while with the whole drumming thing, uh, let's face it, from the beginning of the year, I've had Neil Peart in my mind. And... Um, and going through the Led Zeppelins, you know, there's John Bonham constantly in my mind. 
and now that I'm doing the Who, you know, uh, Keith Moon, you know what I mean? So these drummers uh, are really having a, an effect on me and making the impression on me that, yeah, you know, uh, that observation and the conclusion that to be a great, great band, uh, well, not necessarily, but it seems to me that having the appropriate drummer, the right drummer, really, really helps you to ascend higher. You know, that's just the impression that I have. What do you think of that? Is it just, um, I don't know, an uneducated uh, conclusion? Uh, or am I onto something? Especially you musical types who've um, been in a band, who've you know, got that inclination musically. Am I right about that? Uh, let me know about that. It seems to me that the greatness of a band, especially a rock band, really, really relies on the shoulders of how great their drummer is and how appropriate their drummer is for what they're trying to do. You know? Um, and what am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, Pete Best not being the right drummer for the Beatles. Um, John Rutsey. Even though he was a great drummer, I don't think he was the right drummer for Rush. You know, they needed Neil Peart. Um, and things of that sort. I'm sure that there's a hundred more examples. Um, anyway, I could keep talking about that forever. But so, let me do a little read here, man. Cymbeline. There it is. Okay. So, Cymbeline is a Pink Floyd song from the album soundtrack, uh, More, the film More. It's lyrically, its lyrics vividly tell the tale of a nightmare, which was the title of the song when it was first introduced in Floyd's The Man and the Journey tour shows. The lyrics include a reference to the character Doctor Strange, who was popular at the time due to the psychedelic nature of his adventures. Okay, so it is the Marvel Comics um, character, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch character there. All right, that makes sense. Um, recording. The recording of Cymbeline is, or sorry, on the album is different from the one in the film. The latter version is heard on a record player in a bedroom. The vocals are a different take, though both versions are sung by David Gilmour. The lyrics are also different in one place. The Pink Floyd website credits the woodwind parts, tin whistle or flute, to Nick Mason's wife, Lindy Mason. Pink Floyd played Cymbeline from early 69 until their last show in 71, and it was the longest surviving more piece in the band's live shows. It was dropped from their act along with Fat Old Son and The Embroyo when they began performing early versions of Dark Side of the Moon. Okay. Makes sense, man. You gotta make room for that. Live performances. When the band performed the song live, they made the following changes to the song. The pace of the song was slower and more deliberate, creating an even more somber atmosphere than the studio version. For sure. Richard Wright almost always used Farfisa organ in place of piano, the exception being their performance at uh, KQED Studios in San Francisco, April 29, 1970, in which the studio had a piano for Wright to utilize. <coughs> David Gilmour played electric guitar and performed a guitar solo over where the scat solo occurred in the song. In the spring of 1970, the key of the fade-out section was changed from E minor to B minor. During this section, Roger Waters would bang a gong instead of bongos as the music faded away. After the B minor section, the band presented a selection of sound effects such as footsteps and creaking doors. The effects represented the nightmare, which would conclude with the sound of a loud explosion. Thanks to the panning sounds created by the azimuth coordinator, the sounds would surround the audience and the footsteps would move from left to right through the back of the venue. Cerebral Man. By mid-1969 to early 1970, the band would follow the instrumental and or sound effects uh, section with a repeat of the third verse. 
the lines converging where you stand, etc. Okay. Okay. And so that is uh, Wikipedia Song Fact Info on Cymbeline. Cymbeline. All right, man. So let's check out our third track, that being Embroyo. Our Embryo. Okay. It's a long one. Almost 12 minutes, man. Pink Floyd, Embryo. And it's uh, Festival de Saint Tropez. Uh, and that's all it says. It doesn't say where else or uh, the exact month and time. All right. Embryo. Let's get it. This is called the Embryo. The embryo. Thank you. 
thinking of some of those sounds Jimmy Page was making with that cello bow. Being dazed and confused. Excellent. 